That last one still gets me every single time. Um, my name is Leanne Benton. I am the worship pastor here at Redeemer Church, and I wanted to say welcome to worship. I want to welcome everyone that's joining us online this fall break. Quick question, is it truly fall? Is it fall? Because I don't feel like it's fall weather yet. I'm just thinking we're going to skip a season altogether, which can happen in Oklahoma, right? We are in the seventh week of our fall series um, called In the Way. And as a quick review, we've tackled topics like um, condemnation and shame. We talked about politics. We talked about ego. We talked about tradition. Last week, Pastor Adam talked about unforgiveness. And I don't know about you, but every week I've learned something more about myself, and it's been very informative and sometimes painful as we've been looking at these things that get in the way of our spiritual journey with God. And today, we will be talking about isolation. Can you say that with me? Isolation. Say it one more time, really loud. Isolation. Yeah, I want this to be interactive, and this is my amen corner over here, so thank you. That's right. Uh, I feel like we all kind of have a PhD in isolation after the COVID epidemic. Do you remember where you were when the world started shutting down around us? Do you remember? <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, my daughter has a spirit week at school, and I didn't have this growing up, but the week of homecoming, every single day, the kids get to dress up in a different theme. So there was a mismatch day. There was a Bible host day, a character from the Bible. My daughter does go to a Christian school. And then there was the decades day. So this morning, she came down the stairs, and she was dressed in a gray sweatpants, gray sweatshirt, a hat, and a mask. And I'm like, what are you dressed up as? And she said, it's the COVID decade, mom. And I'm like, that's not a decade. And then we had this whole conversation about how, yes, it was to her and it wasn't to me. And then I realized she's 13. A third of her life has been living in a pandemic or the aftermath of a pandemic. So I agreed to disagree that the COVID decade was what she dressed up as that day. Where were you when the world started getting smaller and smaller? I was in Orlando, Florida. We had flown there for spring break, and my husband graciously dropped us off at a hotel near Disneyland, Disney World, and in, ended up going to work at another city in the state. So Bella and I were on our own, and we knew something was not right when the Disney parks sh started shutting down one at a time. And by Monday, there was only one park open. It was Disney downtown. Okay, so we had the best time. Yes, Bella and I and a few other people that were brave were out at the Disney downtown park. It was kind of cool, I have to say. Never had a park like that in my life. And the next day, we got up and every single Disney park was shut down, right? So I'm like, hey, we can just hang out at our hotel pool. There's a big water park in the middle of our hotel. So we'll just hang here for the day. So we did, and about four o'clock, the hotel staff comes to each person sitting at the pool and hands us a one-page typed sentence that said, the pool will be shutting down at five o'clock today. And that was like in an hour. I'm like, awesome. So by the next morning, this is what our hotel pool looked like. It was a ghost town in Orlando in the middle of spring break. So we decided, I made the executive decision, hey, we're going home early. So we called the Uber, we went to the airport on six lanes with no traffic besides ourselves. We're dropped off at the airport, and we get on the airport shuttle that takes you to your gate. I'm sure if you've been to Orlando, you've been on the shuttle. In the middle of spring break, this is what it looked like. Where is it? There it is. <laughs> that is in the middle of spring break in Orlando, Florida. It was Bella and I and one other person. We got on a plane and the plane is mostly empty. We get back to um, Tulsa, and our car is parked in a sea of nothingness. There's no other cars around us at Fine Airport parking. And Bella and I began to feel the pain and the, the, the shock, honestly, of circumstantial, undesirable isolation. I'm sure you remember where you were when the entire world started shutting down, what my daughter calls the COVID decade. Um, as we start talking about this obstacle of isolation, I want to start with a foundational statement this morning, and it is this. We were created for connection, but we can easily drift toward or be pushed toward isolation. 
If you've been a part of our summer series, you know we've been talking about um, some spiritual practices that Jesus had in his life, like solitude, simplicity, Sabbath. Um, we've talked about these things. In fact, the disciples, if you look at the New Testament, they have this conversation among themselves many, many times, and it goes something like this. Where is Jesus? Where's Jesus? Like, they're always looking for Jesus. And it's because he is slipping away into obscurity for short periods of time to be alone, to pray, to listen to his heavenly Father, his will, and his way. And solitude was that intentional time for him to get energy and stamina and strength that he needed to be fully present in his ministry and in his community. A quick definition this morning of solitude is this. It is a choice to be alone and use that time either for reflection or enjoyment of one's own company. Um, do I have any introverts in the room? Any introverts? Yes, you can raise your hand. <laughs> this is music to your soul, right? The idea of solitude, those short times away, just to be happy with yourself. It's really, really fun. Um, in contrast, I read this week that isolation is the evil twin of solitude. And you know, twins can get mixed up, especially identical twins. Isolation comes from the Latin word insula. You hear insulation. And it also means island. And I immediately thought of the movie that Tom Hanks played in many years ago called Castaway. Do you remember this movie? And he, he has a plane crash and he's stranded on this island for five years and his imaginary best friend is who? Man, that was a good movie. Yes, it was Wilson. And here's a newsflash. You do not have to be stranded on an island with your only friend being Wilson the volleyball to experience isolation. There are experiences all around us all the time that can initiate a drifting into isolation leading to loneliness. And loneliness is defined as a sense of isolation that can persist even when there's other people present, even in a crowded room, even in this room right now. In Genesis, in the very beginning, um, I love this part of the scripture where I, I feel like God is writing a really good worship song. He has this cool chorus that he keeps repeating over and over again as he is creating, and it says, it was good. So I'm going to read some things that God did, and then you're going to be my chorus, and you're going to say back to me, it was good. Are you ready? This is the interactive part. Okay. He created light out of the darkness, and God said, he separated the light from the darkness and called it day. He created dry land and a boundary for the sea. Plants, flowers, and trees. Yes, and great creatures in the sea and birds above the air. Yes, the Hebrew word for good is tov. So God is saying tov, 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 as he's creating all that he sees around him. And at the very end, he adds a bridge. And the bridge goes like this. It was very good. That's right. Nice tagline. And then we get to the second chapter of Genesis. And there's this remarkable statement that God says. He says, not good. <laughs> Forgot about the buzzer. Not good. So he says, good, very good, and then not good. What is not good to God? What is not good to God? Let's read Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. And another translation says it this way, It's not good that the human is alone. Period. End of statement. That is a complete statement. This is not just a marital statement. This is a relational statement. It is not good for humans to be alone. And if we look at the scripture from the very, very beginning, we see that God designed us to live in relationship with each other. Isolation was never a part of the plan. And notice that Adam, here's Adam in the most, most beautiful, perfect place known to man, in the Garden of Eden, in the presence of God, and still God says it is not good. We are created for connection and community, for God's glory and neighbor's good. 
you are not better by yourself. I'm going to say it again. You are not better by yourself. This is what the Bible teaches us. And this morning, I want to give just a small list of things that can begin to cause us to drift away from each other. And here's number one. Life changes, like the death of a loved one, or a friend, or retirement, or job loss. Think if one of these is connected to you this morning. Or it could be anxiety, depression, and fear. It could be unresolved trauma that's happened in your past or that's happening now. Physical challenges that make it harder to interact socially with others. It could be discrimination. It can be relational pain, even church hurt. Introversion, social media can become a substitute for in-person socialization. This is by no means a comprehensive list, but it's a sampling of reasons why you and I can find ourselves drifting away from the other. And I can see this as a strategy of the enemy as he uses these types of things to separate us from each other. There is the danger in the obstacle. This is the thing that get, it gets in the way of our spiritual life with God. I've been driving around town this week. I'm sure you have too if you weren't on fall break far away. And I've I've encountered some roadblocks this week, especially right down here, including a road closure. Like literally my maps is like recalculating because you can't get through. And I wanna encourage you this morning, the things we're talking about in the way is not a road closure. This is the good news. You saw that video at the beginning when people are like tripping over and falling over and trying to jump over. The point is they're going in the right direction. And guess what? We can get up and we can keep going towards forward. We do not have to turn around. This is what um, we are learning as a body of Christ. These are things that get in the way, but we can overcome in Christ and in community. Um, I'm calling it out today because we don't talk about this in the church a lot. We don't talk about isolation, but it can rob us of our very life and the life that God has for us. John 10.10 reminds us that Satan is a thief. It says the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Amen? So separating yourself from others is one of the most devastating strategies of the enemy of our soul because then we become vulnerable. And we become vulnerable physically, sometimes emotionally, and spiritually. We're in a battle on our own, and that's not the way God designed it. Dr. Vivek Murthy is the Surgeon General of the United States, and he became the Surgeon General in 2014. And he said the first thing he wanted to do was a listening tour. So he went to every state in in the United States and listened to um, the people and asked questions, how are you doing? And he just wanted to listen and learn, kind of a um, phenomenological study of humanity. And um, keep in mind, this was before COVID-19. This was 2014. And he recently put together a letter, and this is what it, the title is, Epidemic of Loneliness and Isolation. And this is what he said out of that letter. People began to tell me that they felt isolated, invisible, and insignificant. Even when they couldn't put their finger on the word lonely, time and time again, people of all ages and backgrounds from every corner of this country would tell me, I have to shoulder all of life's burdens by myself. And if I disappear tomorrow, no one will even notice. He goes on to talk about the mortality rate that is connected to disconnection socially. And he says it's equal to smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. And that statistically, half of us in this room have experienced isolation, will experience, or are going to experience isolation in our life. Even the top doctor recognized that there are detrimental consequences to isolation and loneliness. And he's backing up the Bible. He doesn't even know it. He also talked about the conclusion that there are healing effects of social connection and community. Again, a biblical truth that he is proving in his phenomenological study. I love what the Bible says. It warns of isolation and it also gives us an incentive to be in community with each other, to do life together. First Peter 5.8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. 
Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone, say someone, to devour. Notice he says someone singular, an individual standing alone is prone to attack. A lion or any predatory animal usually does not go for the herd. He doesn't take on the strongest in a group. No, he prowls around looking for someone disconnected, standing alone, that he may devour. That is vulnerability. And if you are feeling isolated today, you are at greater risk than you know. I'm going to say that again. If you are feeling isolated today, you are at greater risk than you know. The Bible gives warnings of why isolation is so dangerous. It also gives us this beautiful picture of why we need to stay together, to live a life in community, flourishing in the life of Christ. Our executive staff has been reading a book recently, and it's entitled Growing Up, A Lifelong Journey. And we've been discussing amongst ourselves, you know, about our identity and how we see ourselves in Christ. And this quote out of the book just jumped off the page. It said, we need much help from our brothers and sisters in Christ who can remind us of who we really are. We need each other. Um, our very identity is discovered and it's uncovered in community. Isn't that beautiful? You can't do it by yourself. Even Jesus, the most perfect human being on the face of this earth, needed people. He surrounded himself with a community of people, some disciples and a few close friends throughout his life and ministry. I'm going to read this passage from Matthew 26, and I'm going to do this quick scan version, but I'm going to put the actual full text on the screen for you to read. And it says in Matthew 26, Then Jesus went with them to the Olive Garden, the Gethsemane, and he went to pray. And he took three of his friends, Peter, James, and John, and he told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And he went a little further, and he prayed to his father, God, if this cup can be taken from me, please do, but your will, not mine. And then he returned to his disciples, and he found them asleep. And then Peter said, he said to Peter, can you watch with me even one hour? For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And then Jesus left them a second time to go pray. And he prayed, my father, take this cup away from me, but your will, not mine. And he returned again, and he found them, what? Sleeping. Yes but they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things, and then he came back to his disciples and he said, go ahead and sleep, have your rest, but look, my betrayer is here. In other words, even one of his friends in his community was about to betray him, and his three best friends were asleep, right? But they were there. Um, if there was one person on this earth who could claim that he was better as a loner, it would have been Jesus. He could have had a lot of excuses. They just don't get me. They're not on my level. Um, when I talk in parables, they don't understand. I'm the son of God. I have my heavenly father. I don't need anybody else. If there was one leader that could say I'm better, it's, it's really lonely at the top. If one person could say that, it would have been Jesus. Yet, he chose to live life in community. Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration after this scene right before he ascends to heaven, he has the same three guys with him. He's got Peter and James and John during his lowest low and his highest high. They were a part of his story. They were a part of his community. See, the only time we can say it's lonely at the top is when you choose to climb the mountain alone. And Jesus chose community during his most challenging moment before his death and his most celebrated moment before he ascended into heaven. And the three disciples were with him and brought comfort to Jesus just with their presence. Even when they fell asleep in the garden, they were still there. Have you ever gone through a trial in your life and you've had friends come and they just sit and they're just with you? Have you ever experienced that? They don't have to say a word. They are just present and the very presence brings comfort to you. Um, I'm not alone when they are there with me. And Jesus basically said the same thing. I'd rather have some friends go to sleep on me, not say a word, and still be in community. Isn't that beautiful? 
Jesus mirroring this for us. And listen to Paul in Hebrews 10. It says this, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And listen to James. In James chapter 5, verse 16, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Now remember, 1 John 1.9 still stands. It still stands that if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and forgive us of all unrighteousness. That alone God can do, right? But the scripture in Hebrews and James, it gives us a different perspective. It gives us a rich interior view of our confession vertically to God, and it uncovers the fullness of healing that is realized in community as we confess horizontally to each other. When we confess our sins to each other, that is where true, full healing comes. That's what the scripture says. And in Galatians 6, it says this, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. This is the way of Christ. Confess to other believers Pray for each other that you may be healed and help one another share in the burden. Help lift the burden off of others and love others gently and humbly. Can you say gently and humbly? Say it again. Gently and humbly. We have to help people navigate through the pain and struggle together with accountability, with correction in the love of Christ. This is what friendship looks like. This is what healthy community can be. And this is what a flourishing life in Christ was meant to look like. So here are some questions today for us to just meditate on, think through. Are you humbly and gently helping others through challenges? Is that what you're doing? Or are you judging and gossiping in the disguise of prayer? Are you humbly and gently helping? Or are you safely watching on the sidelines? It's the safe place, right? As a commentator, rather than a participant in the game of life. Yeah, when you're in the game, you can get hurt, yes? When you're in the game, it gets messy. And there's some people that will need to re-earn your trust or earn your trust for the first time, and that that's to be expected. But It's worth the risk to live a life with Jesus and others. This is the way of Christ for God's glory and neighbor's good. So here's my encouragement to you. Get in the game. That's how we were created to be from the very beginning. We were not meant to do this alone. We are better together. We are better together. And if you are struggling right here, right now, if you are experiencing isolation, even in this room full of people, let me tell you, I want to pray for you. And I want to say, you are not alone. You are not alone. There is a new level of healing, a new level of forgiveness, of joy and peace and love that can come from community and that will change your life. You are not alone. You are better together with others. And Jesus lived out this model for all of us to see while he was on this earth. That's the testimony of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May it be our testimony as well. You pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, we pray this morning for anyone facing the hurdle the barrier of isolation. We pray for the loneliness, the pain that's caused maybe by people in a community. God, I believe that you can change their story. I believe that you can heal brokenness, that you can heal relationships. 
and that as we learn to gently and humbly be the body of Christ, you can use us as your hands and your feet. So God, help us do that work well. Help us to heal with our words of confession to each other. God, let us see the least, the last, and the lost around us. Let us not so quickly go by others, but remember that they are a part of our community. And God, I thank you what you're doing in our lives in this room. For anyone feeling isolated or lonely, I pray that your presence will be overwhelmingly healing to them and that others around them can surround them in prayer and restoration. And that is what we pray this morning. That is what we believe we can do, you can do in this place. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Go ahead and stand as we continue to worship this morning in response.